This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. So, word on the street is that you're looking for everything and anything related to Georgia Ag and Farming. Well, you've come to the right place. Happy to have you along for the latest episode of the Farm Monitor. And as always, we have got a great show for you. Straight ahead, some promising news at the Georgia Cattlemen's Conference as beef prices are expected to go up in 2022. Still, why experts are advising against the purchase of more cattle and the increase of herd sizes. Also on the program, with reported cases of avian influenza in numerous states, we'll tell you the precautions Georgia ag officials are taking to prevent an outbreak here and what you should do if you suspect AI in your flock. Plus, Mama Delessia would be proud of her baby boy. Today on Meals in the Field, we are creating a staple Italian dish using fresh Georgia-grown vegetables and a Georgia-grown sauce made from scratch. All this and so much more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. It was an event three years in the making. The Georgia Cattlemen's Association finally able to hold its first convention since 2019. Damon Jones made the trip to Savannah for the much anticipated return and tells you why producers are cautiously optimistic about the upcoming year. After more than a thousand days, cattlemen from across the state were finally able to meet again in person for the annual GCA convention. It was a great opportunity to network, get an update on the industry, and of course, catch up with old friends they haven't seen in a while. It's been three years since we had a convention in person and everybody that's come in this morning and last night that I've talked to has been thrilled to be here and that thrills me. Um, but my favorite part is just all us, us getting together and being able to visit about all the things that we face, the things that are trials for us and the things that we enjoy. Um, farm folks like to be together. This annual convention wasn't the only thing affected by the pandemic, as producers were faced with everything from higher input costs to massive supply chain issues. However, with a recent uptick in prices, they are encouraged about the future of the industry. So as, as we've seen a lot of producers uh, reduce their herd size, we are seeing that those prices are going up. Producers are, are encouraged by that. However, we need to make sure that we continue that and not, not have such a steep cycle. Um, you know, we've been on a roller coaster ride in the cattle market since uh, about June of 2019, but uh, luckily we are seeing that trend come out of there. I think producers are encouraged and I think ultimately we'll see higher prices in the near future. While the outlook for 2022 does appear promising, cattlemen are encouraged to keep the long-term picture in view as well. That means not overextending their operations and putting a future strain on the market. Uh, one of the biggest things we see is when, when beef prices go up, producers start buying more cattle and we start to increase our herd sizes to the point that it's unsustainable and then about that time that's when the market crashes again. And so uh, we, we want to grow, but we want to grow steadily, grow incrementally, making sure that we're uh, focusing on the future. That future does come with a little bit of uncertainty as the pandemic is still having a major effect on the supply chain and on the producer's operation budget. That is, that's one of the biggest issues we face. Not, on, not only the price of cattle, but input cost. You know, fertilizer is, is extremely high, feed is high, all the inputs have, have gone up, um, and that affects your bottom line. The association is looking to increase their bottom line as well by promoting some of their programs like the direct-to-consumer beef sales. It's an initiative that will make the entire process from field to shelves completely transparent. One of the things that we've seen uh, through the pandemic and saw it prior to was that consumers really want to know where their food is, is produced, right? And so having the ability to know the farmer, to understand where that cow is being raised, to understand what those production practices are going into uh, making that beef the best possible product that they can find is incredibly important for our industry. With those type of programs, as well as their constant legislative work on both the state and national levels, GCA is hoping to increase their membership in the coming years. Whenever we, we go to Atlanta or Washington for that matter, but Mainly in Atlanta, when we tell them we got 5,000 members, that speaks volumes to them, and that, that catches their attention. And we need those numbers to, to have their support. So that, that's a, the important part of it. Reporting from Savannah, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. 
In other ag news, the Georgia poultry industry now on high alert and ramping up biosecurity measures after multiple states outside of Georgia reporting cases of the newest and deadliest strain of avian influenza. As a precaution, the Georgia Department of Agriculture has suspended all sales events as well as shows pertaining to poultry and feathered fowl until further notice. Any questions or concerns you may have about AI or even suspect that your birds have avian influenza, you can call the AI hotline at 770-766-6850. Testing is free through the Georgia Poultry Lab Network. Well, how about Georgia's finest bringing home some national honors in recent weeks? Starting with Matt and Melissa Bottoms of Concord, Georgia, one of four winners of the 2021 National Outstanding Young Farmer Award. Matt and Melissa, very active in Georgia Farm Bureau, in addition to operating both a nursery and row crop farm. Also, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association recognizing Vaughn Farms in Monroe County as one of seven national winners for its Environmental Stewardship Award. James Vaughn, along with his family, managed nearly 5,600 acres, which are devoted to forage crops, pasture for cattle, as well as timberland for pulp, lumber, and energy production. I do believe it was Confucius who once said, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Well, as a horse enthusiast, Hannah Zeplatal definitely loves her job. And as John Holcomb reports, she also loves developing great riders. For Hannah Zeplatal, who owns and operates a small horse farm in Forsyth County, it's more than just a job. It's a passion that's been instilled in her since birth. Zapletal, who was raised in Haiti with her parents who served as missionaries, grew up helping train horses that the locals could use for their everyday lives. I grew up in Haiti down in the Caribbean and one of the things that we did because we were not, uh, my dad wasn't a pastor at that time and so his background was heavy machinery and construction and everything down there is done by hand. So you know you hoe a garden, you don't have a tractor that plows the garden and so we started breeding um, primarily buggy horses. We worked with them, uh, to, you know, because an animal can pull ten times what it can carry and so because I was the oldest of four children we had a Canadian trainer who used to come down every single year and would train the upcoming three and four year old horses. And since I spoke the language and I was the horse craziest bunch of the whole group, I would translate for him. And I was also the one that would, you know, climb up on them and he'd be like, hang on real tight. <laughs> you know. And so that was my job from the time that I was about seven years old. After coming to the U.S. for college, Hannah bought a horse and began giving riding lessons. Today, she owns and operates this farm, Wildwood Farm, where she specializes in teaching others to ride, a place that is meant to be a fun, encouraging, and educational environment for riders, something she takes great pride in. For me, the connection comes with the animal, and people can learn so much without actually dealing with the live creature. You know, you have to be responsible with how you handle it. So we start off at the beginning. We take the kids out to the pastures. We have to catch the horses. They all live outside. And so they learn how to catch the horse. We teach them how to brush the horse, because again, it's a very therapeutic for the human. You can feel the horse's heartbeat. The horses actually mirror the human. So then we bring them down the hill, and then we come and help them, you know, teach them how to get on, how to steer, how to go forward. And then as time goes on, I'm very careful with, I don't want them just to be able to do the skill, you know, like on, a, on, a, on the cuff. I want them to do the skill well, you know, and so we don't, you know, you're not going to be jumping the first two years that you're here probably. You need to learn how to do your walk track canter. You need to learn how to do your leads. You need to be able to do it all without stirrups. And so I'm really careful with how I build the foundation for them. Hannah likens learning the foundations of horseback riding to learning to drive a car and believes it's so important for riders to master the basics before moving on to the more difficult stuff. It's laying a foundation, that, but it takes time to do it. And if I say, here's a car, now we're going to go drive on 285 at rush hour traffic and you're going to learn how to drive, it's a little daunting. And so if you take the time to learn how to prep them, learn how to do the foundation stuff. A lot of these kids go on to do amazing things with horses. One of our long-term students, she was ranked third in the, in the country for children's jumpers for years. So we add foundation gently and kindly and uh, instead of, you know, here's your horse, go get on, try not to die. Reporting and coming for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. After the break, how could you go wrong with this? Italian cuisine mixed in with a little southern charm and Georgia-grown products. Sounds like another Meals from the Field to me. That's next when the Farm Monitor continues.
Well, once upon a time, at the turn of the 20th century, there was a family who wanted a better life. So they packed up their belongings, left Sicily and Italy, and headed to the United States. That family, the Delisio family. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of Bios in the Field and welcome back to the Farm Monitor. Joining us, as always, our dear friend, Marsha Crowley. Why do I tell you that story? Well, today, in honor of the D'Alessios, our theme is Italian. That's right. I'm kidding. It's not really in honor of the D'Alessios. Could be. The reason, we could, we'll make it the D'Alessios. We'll make you know, it. Make the D'Alessios like to make everything about themselves anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> but no, the reason why we're doing an Italian theme today, really nothing is in season. Nothing. So you wanted to kind of... You know, do, do something, something fun. Yeah, do yeah. something fun, and Italians are fun. They're We're fun. We love our food, too. Everybody loves Italian food. Exactly. So what do you got for We're us? We're going to do stuffed shells, and this is um, a 30-ounce jar of store-bought spaghetti sauce. Okay. But there is a Georgia-grown member that makes it. Oh, okay. Grandma Martino's. Grandma. She's down in Black Shooting by local markets Grandma down there. Grandma Martino's, okay. Right, now I, the beef in there, there's some beef in it's there. That Italian, could be so grown. Italian sausage. Italian it could sausage. be too. There you go, okay. All right, so that's the sauce. You you know, cook it and do whatever you want to do with it. I've put a little bit of it in a pan and I'm putting it in this disposable pan because it's either going to go home with a lucky audience member or it can be frozen. So I'm going to move this out of the way. But that's just your your spaghetti sauce with meat in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, stuffing. This is two cups of ricotta cheese with an egg in there. Two cups of shredded mozzarella cheese. I'm going to save a little bit. I've got some back there. Add to the top. Like a cup and a half of Parmesan cheese, grated. And three cups of fresh torn spinach. Mm. And to me, the fresh spinach is better in this. It's it's raw, um, but it's obviously going to cook. Let me start stirring this up. You're going to mix all this together. And this is really the tricky part. You know, I'm having flashbacks to the days of growing up in the kitchens at the holiday seasons or during the holiday season, smelling up of Italian food. Oh, and I love Italian food. Sorry, I didn't mean to elbow you there. That's okay. Right? All right, I'm going to pretend that this is mixed pretty good. All right. And then you're going to buy the jumbo shells and cook them, which is what this is. Mm -hmm. You're going to stuff about, let me get one so I don't really make a fool out of myself, about a tablespoon or two tablespoons of this in the shells, like I said, that are cooked. And you can add, you know, garlic to this mixture. You can add more Italian spices if you want. You can leave the spinach out. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't do that, obviously. All right, and you can put about that much in each shell, and you're going to need about 14 to 15 cooked shells. I always have a hard time when they tell you a half a box of pasta, so I counted them. Okay. All right, you're going to put these with the opening side up in your pan, and then you're going to pour the rest of the sauce on top of it, which obviously I'm going to still stuff these, but they don't need to see me do that. And then you're going to put a little bit more of mozzarella cheese, and you're going to bake it at 350 till it starts to bubble about 30, 35 minutes. And that is that. That's that. And then what good Italian meal has got here. to Give have some room. a good Italian dessert. All right. And this is tiramisu, which means a pick-me-up in Italian. Sure. Yeah, okay. Now I'm going to, these are lady fingers, a small package of lady fingers, which you can find in my grocery stores, it's in the bakery deli section. Um, and it's just, if you can't find that, you could use pound cake or angel food cake. All right, you're going to brush that with Kahlua, which is a coffee liqueur. Okay. And it's not going to cook out, so if you don't want to use the liqueur, you can use a very strong coffee All instead, right. like an espresso. I was going to say like an espresso or something? Yeah, like an espresso. Okay. But this really is important to this. All right, let me just get these. You're going to brush these. Oh, the uh, lady fingers come already split, so you're going to use half of them on the bottom. You can smell that. I don't think you can. Can't you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's potent, but anyway, it's good. All right. Then you're going to add, this is cheesecake-flavored pudding which who knew that they even had that? Mm. I did not. If you can't find that, it's pretty prevalent with the 
pudding mixtures, you could you could use vanilla. I know they have it, but I've stayed away from it because I didn't want to eat it's, the whole box. It's very, very good. This is a half a cup of softened cream cheese. And you're going to spread this on the top of the lady fingers. Like I said, this is so good. You, every Italian restaurant I've ever been to serves this. Now, I don't know that I'm going to be willing to pay what they ask for it now that I know how easy mm -hmm. and inexpensive it is to make. It's no bake, so you can make this ahead of time. You spread that like that, move that out of the way. So you could have taken it a step further today and gone with the cannolis, too. I could have done that. <laughs> You're going to top this with the rest of these lady fingers. These kind of got a little dry sitting out under the lights, but that's all right. We'll just add more Kahlua, right? There you go. And then you're going to brush this with the rest of the Kahlua. This is about, it's a little bit less than a quarter of a cup. Okay. And you could, you could do more, of course. You just don't want the lady fingers to get too soggy, and you don't want to really overpower it. Then you're going to top this with Cool Whip. Whip topping and a little bit of chocolate um, powder on top, and refrigerate it and serve it when you're ready. You're going to serve this Italian meal with your favorite salad mm -hmm. and Italian bread. And okay. there you have it. And there you have it. And there you see the finished product. You've got the stuffed shells. You've got the uh, tiramisu, which uh, no nobody took a bite out of nope. it. We dug it out of there to kind of give you a, uh, a side view of yeah. it. So your complete Italian meal, and it's very simple to make, folks. Uh, you can do it yourself at home. All I gotta do, log on to uh, farm-monitor.com. Head up top to the recipe section. Everything is there for you in detail. The list keeps growing and growing, and now we've added some more delicious Italian dishes as well. So uh, my Italian's a little rusty, a little rusty. Let me say. I wouldn't know the difference. Grazie. <laughs> Molte <laughs> bene. So thank you very, in other words, thank you very much, okay. Marcia. Thank you, grazie as well, and we will see you next month. Ciao. Well, your appetite for good food may be satisfied, but the show isn't over just yet. Up next, like many of you, he gets paid to farm. However, his fields and equipment are all virtual and he's got quite a following. More on Baxley, Georgia's Harley Hand when the Farm Monitor continues. One year ago, I became the Dean and Director of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of Georgia. Through the last 365 days, I have seen firsthand the strength of CAES. We are leading the way in agricultural innovation in order to care for our global ecosystems, enrich our communities, and equip the next generation of leaders in agricultural and environmental sciences. Across our college, we have the best and brightest students, faculty, and staff, and our groundbreaking research makes a meaningful difference everywhere CAS has a presence. This first year has been full of opportunities to grow, to innovate, to elevate. As I look to the next year and beyond, I'm excited to see what we accomplish together to ensure the production of nutritious, safe, and sustainable foods, the health of our planet, and the well-being of the people on it. I hope you will join me in the CAS Network as we foster cutting-edge innovation to impact the world. What's going on, everybody? We are live here today with some Farming Simulator 19 once again. Bill, good morning, dude. Terry, Michael, Dave, good morning, guys. Meet Harley Hand of Baxley, Georgia. In the video game world, he is what you would call a professional gamer. Yes, Harley earns a living playing video games. 
And this electronic wonder is his office. Given his game of choice, plus the fact he lives in rural Georgia, one would assume that Harley has an ag background. Well, that is not the case. I grew up in a town that's like nothing but farming, but other than that, I've never done it. <laughs> other, like my parents, whenever I was little, would, they had a garden in the yard, so that's about the closest thing I've ever done to any farming. But you'd never know it listening to one of Harley's daily Facebook sessions. He can speak the language of ag with the best of them. We just bought a ton of cows the other day, a ton of pigs also, so we're gonna have a lot of farming work and animal work to do on top of all of the mining work that we do here. And with over 40,000 followers, some of them real life farmers who pay to watch Harley lay down a sprinkle or two of virtual fertilizer, he's managed to tap into a whole new audience who, like Harley, knew nothing about ag before playing the game. Got lucky really when I started because it was right before the uh, pandemic started. So a lot of people were at home and it, uh, I was at 30,000 followers before the year, you know, my first year. And now we're at 43,000. So, but um, the game has, it's come a long way. Indeed it has. Now in its 12th year of publication, the Farming Simulator series has reportedly sold over 25 million copies combined in addition to 90 million mobile downloads. Its developer, Giant Software, goes to extreme lengths to ensure the game is both fun and realistic as possible. Yeah, so it's also, in my opinion, really important to, to tell the people that farming is, yeah, a lot more than we tell in the game. In our game, most of the things are really simplified to, to um, make the game enjoyable and so it's, so it's fun playing it. And also the Precision Farming DLC aims also for that, that fun. So it's also a bit simplified, but yeah, tells the people that it's more than, than a simple process that farmers are doing out there. It's the draw of being able to do stuff that you wouldn't normally be able to do. Akia Ramming, senior editor at Enthusiast Gaming, has been reviewing the Farming Simulator series since 2017 and says he isn't surprised at how popular the game has become. He also enlightened me as to why a person would pay to watch a gamer like Harley farm from the comforts of his computer room. The draw of it is, I would say, a lot of their personality. They tend to have very friendly personas, and so they make you feel like, you know, like that's my buddy, you know, even though you don't actually know who they are. <laughs> and so it's that factor, plus, you know, you're getting to watch them, and because they do it so often, you may want to emulate their style, you may want to emulate you know, their gameplay formula to get a similar experience as to what they're showing. Yeah, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and, and um, they just ask a bunch of questions about farming or, or uh, you know, they, they start wanting to play the game and learn themselves and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. I've never reached out to farmers other than just talking to the few that are in my stream that, that farm themselves, but um, I definitely, it has sparked an interest. I've looked up videos to see you know, try to compare it to the game, see what, you know, what differences I can find. And I've definitely, uh, you know, wanted to, to go work on a farm for a day or two just to see what it's like and, and use it and, you know, record it as well for content on the stream. Unfortunately, that music means we are done for the time being. However, friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia Farms, be sure you check out all of our social media platforms, including farm-monitor.com. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.